All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a Monday seminar, pre-lunch, get your brains going. All right. I'm Lee Torres. Um, I am an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences here at Oregon State University and a PI in the Marine Mammal Institute. Um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Bob Bailey, which um, to some needs no introduction, but to the others, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Bob is the current uh, board president of the Alaka Alliance, which is an Oregon nonprofit organization dedicated to returning sea otters to the Oregon coast. He grew up in Coos County on the Oregon coast and is a graduate of Portland State University with a bachelor's in earth science. He retired in 2011, although you wouldn't know it with how much he works, um, after nearly 30 years of working on coastal and ocean policy and management for the state of Oregon um, Coastal Management Program. From 2003 to 2006, he served as a city commissioner for the city of Oregon City, and he has served on the board of directors of the Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition and the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. When not working, to bring back sea otters to our beautiful Oregon coast. He enjoys playing guitar with friends and making sure his front yard is presentable. And I'll also give a little anecdote that I first met Bob soon after arriving here in Oregon, I think in 2014 or 2015, Bob sort of approached myself and Flax and Conway with this idea of, wouldn't it be interesting if we could sort of figure out more about where sea otters might want to spend time along the Oregon coast? which prompted me, me to take on a graduate student, Dom Kone, who graduated a number of years ago now, but did um, produce a really foundational paper that led the way to a lot of the discussions we're having today about whether sea otters um, should be introduced to Oregon and, and what that might mean for our Oregon coast. Bob's a pleasure to work with and a fountain of knowledge, so I'll let him take it away. Thank you very much. Can, is this uh, thing working? All right. Uh, this is fairly imposing geometry, the space here. I, I gave this talk um, last Monday night in Port Orford in their little library auditorium, a meeting room, which was wonderful. And then the next night in uh, the uh, Boat House Auditorium on the campus of the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology in Charleston, and so I've gone through it a couple of times and got a little bit of feel for this story, but uh, to, to put it all together in, the con in this context with all the technology is, um, I wouldn't say daunting, but I'm very aware that uh, things can go wrong. So for those of you here, thank you for coming over. And for, oh, I just did it. Yeah, let's see if we can ramp it up a little bit. Okay, yeah, get the volume up a little louder. Is that better? All right, I, yeah, I can hear it bouncing a little bit. Um, and for those of you online, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And for those of you watching this later in uh, a recorded situation with a glass of wine, good for you. So this is a little story that has a lot of parts and it has implications for <clears throat> bringing sea otters back to Oregon again in the future. And as I got into trying to understand what had happened with the reintroductions in 1970 and 71, the more I learned that there was not a lot of information and what there was, was you kind of had to tease it out. So I spent probably six or eight months researching, looking at papers, tracking down papers, finding photos, talking to even with some people who were there, including Dr. Bruce Mate, who was the founder of the Marine Mammal Institute here at Oregon State and retired just a few years ago. Bruce, um, you'll encounter him again in the, in the story, but Bruce was uh, finishing up his PhD at the University of Oregon in Charleston when this all occurred. And he's really the guy who made the first observations and really sort of tumbled to the fact that this was an important thing to keep track of. And it was he who, when a guy named Ron Jameson came along uh, a year or two later to work on his master's at Oregon State, Ron, uh, excuse me, by then Bruce had moved over to OSU 
and he sort of pointed Ron at this <clears throat> reintroduction and said, this is, your, this is your thesis paper. I want you to keep track of what's going on and write it up as to what's, what, what's happening. So between those two, Bruce and his early observations and some of the written record he left, as well as Ron Jameson's master's paper. Those are really kind of the foundational pieces of this story. But there's a, more to it, a lot, a lot of photographs and a lot of other people to talk to too. So let's jump right into it here. He said, blithely. Uh, this is not wanting to advance here. Oh, either this. Yeah, on. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. So 50 years ago, and you know, this is just about the extent of people's memories, too, uh, for those that were involved. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, I was living in the Bandon area during this time. And uh, there are certainly a lot of things I don't recall uh, from that time. But one of them is, I never knew about the sea otters down there. So 50 years ago is within the arc of living memory. And I was happy to capture some of those firsthand accounts, but it's also starting to get to be uh, a while. So sea otters came, they didn't stay long. Here's the story. So Monday morning on July 18th, 1970, uh, this big C-130 cargo plane from Alaska came down out of the clouds and landed at Cape Blanco Airfield, just north of Port Orford. And inside were 31 special passengers. So the question is, why were they being flown to the Southern Oregon coast? That's the first thing. Why, why to here? Uh, we know that sea otters had once lived along the Oregon coast, but for more than a century, no wild otters have lived here. We know that they are here from several important uh, sources of information. One is the indigenous memory of sea otters on the Oregon coast, including stories of seeing sea, family stories of seeing sea otters at this place just north of the Rogue River, which in the Dene language was called Otter Rock. Today it's called Otter Point. There are other indigenous stories about seeing or hunting sea otters at Gull Rock just north of Cape Blanco and at uh, uh, Sunset Bay on Cape Arago. So when outsiders arrived, sea otters were in fact present. There are interesting accounts of people hunting them, including this account, along with a fanciful sketch, a rather tragic sketch from Harper's Monthly Magazine in 1856, hunting sea otters near the mouth of Coos Bay. Sea otters had become a source of financial wealth by the late 1700s, and throughout the 1800s, were the object of the so-called maritime fur trade, which eventually wiped out sea otters more or less from the Northern Island of Japan all the way around to Baja, California. An initial population of somewhere in the order of what 250 to 300,000 animals were down to probably fewer than 3,000 by the time it, uh, it was all done. And sea otters on the Oregon coast, even though this was likely not a, a major area for the maritime fur trade, the sea otters on this coast became a commodity as well and were not immune to the lure of, of the wealth that the, even a single pelt could, could provide. By 1911, they were pretty much gone from Oregon too. This is an, a little clip from the uh, July 1910 Coos Bay Times, the predecessor of the Coos Bay world about Mr. George Forty, who had arrived in Coos Bay with the hide of a sea otter that he got below Port Orford. And he had brought it up to have his, this guy, S.C. Brown, take a look at it and evaluate it. And Mr. Brown said it was probably worth $500, which in 1910 was a lot of money. Interestingly enough, the Forty family still lives in the Port Orford area. So the sea otters pretty much remain absent in, along the Oregon coast and Northern California, uh, except for single animals that we see drifting by occasionally, like this little guy that was out at Yaquina Head a couple years ago. So there's about 800 miles between the population along the Olympic coast of Washington and the population that's a little bit further north in Santa Cruz at Pigeon Point. 
And that's a gap that uh, is increasingly um, of concern for the long range, the long term conservation of sea otter populations. And as part of the, it's the gap that we hope to intend to fill. So the other player in this geographically is Amchitka Island. It is one of several places where sea otters, little remnant populations found refuge from the hunting and survived the, the sea otter holocaust as it were. Out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, transitioning from uh, really the broad Pacific up into the Bering Sea. In these wild and remote places by the 1960s, sea otters uh, rebounded. They were protected by law beginning in 1911, which really put a legal end to the international commercial uh, fur trade. Uh, and by the 1960s, uh, the, the populations have started to rebound in these little uh, isolated areas. And it's estimated that there were probably 3,500 animals around Amchitka Island by the mid 1960s. Amchitka <clears throat> was a a location of interest during World War II. Uh, the US, towards the later stages of the war, was concerned about a Japanese invasion of uh, into across the North Pacific into the US, and likewise made plans for a potential invasion of Japan. And Amchitka lent, lent itself geographically to, uh, to be a site where that could take place. So the military built this vast, significant infrastructure of airfields, barracks, water supplies, um, the whole nine yards, uh, power stations, and uh, eventually 15,000 men were stationed uh, on Amchitka Island. The World War II ended. Uh, there was no invasion of Japan nor of the US. Uh, the military left, but those facilities remained. And after World War II, of course, was the Cold War, the jockeying between the Soviet Union and the US and its allies over um, a political uh, survival, as it were, of many of these uh, entities. So during the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union was testing <clears throat> nuclear weapons uh, and the US was keeping pace, if not leading the pack, and was drawing criticism for uh, testing in Nevada. Uh, both above ground and underground testing, and so decided to take advantage of the facilities in Alaska on Amchitka Island, out in the middle of essentially nowhere, out in the middle of the ocean, uh, where all these facilities and, and uh, infrastructure already existed. So the Atomic Energy Commission set up camp on that infrastructure on Amchitka Island, and by the mid-1960s started uh, doing underground tests of various sizes. The first one in 1965 was the so-called long shot, the equivalent of 80,000 tons of dynamite. In 1969, the next one, Melro, was 1.2 megatons, 1.2 thousand uh, tons of uh, dynamite equivalent. And then Kanakan was planned for some time in 1971 that would be a five megaton, quite large. And at the size of that, and by this time, the anti-nuclear crowd was really uh, galvanizing, and uh, the public became quite alarmed at the prospect of this test. Interestingly enough, the Congress had recently passed in 1970 the National Environmental Policy Act that required federal agencies to uh, conduct a, uh, an environmental impact statement, and the AEC was no exception. So they had to do an, an environmental impact statement, not happy about it though, uh, and especially not happy about having to release it to the public. Uh, wildlife officials had also, and that means federal and state, had also become alarmed at the prospect of a significant sized nuclear test around this island where wildlife was, in particular sea otters. And so eventually the Atomic Energy Commission agreed to provide funding and other resources like the cargo plane, uh, to support the translocation of sea otters to Oregon, as well as to Washington and British Columbia. So uh, capturing and moving sea otters from this island out in the middle of the ocean to Oregon, was not, this was not a casual undertaking, and, or to any of the other areas for that matter. 
A number of agencies, federal, state, from a lot of jurisdictions had to be galvanized. Uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game really be, kind of became the lead agency because of their experience in capturing and translocating sea otters. And this is a photo of some guys from the Alaska Fish and Game loading a sea otter in its cage into a float plane somewhere in Alaska. So altogether, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game during this period of time uh, translocated a number of animals from Anchitka to other places, principally Southeast Alaska, uh, a small batch up to St. George Island and the Pribilofs, the, those also did not survive, uh, all, Vancouver Island and the Olympic coast of Washington. Eventually then in 1970 and 71, they would uh, translocate animals to Southern Oregon. So Kanakin was in fact detonated in November of 1971. It was uh, a fairly sizable blast. It was buried a mile underground is still things rock and, rocked and rolled upon the surface. There are films of, of what uh, went on at the surface and while it didn't erupt, erupt, it was clearly there were visible effects uh, physical effects on the surface. So it's estimated that between 600 and 1,000 sea otters died as a result of that blast. Another way that Amchitka Island figures into this story is that in 1969, a young PhD candidate, Jim Estes, showed up on, on uh, Amchitka. Uh, he was, the AEC was contracting with him to help count sea otters while he did his research on top-down predation of these animals on the ecosystem. And his observations that were not published until 1974 first described the ecological importance of sea otters as keystone species. He told me that he, when he went diving on Amchitka Island where there were sea otters, he could see a vital and healthy ecosystem kelp forests, fish, you know, invertebrates, all that. And when he went to an, a nearby island, only 200 miles away, Shemya, where there were no sea otters and dove, he said it was an aha moment for him of understanding that all he was seeing were urchin barrens, no uh, kelp forest, and a, a very much of a lack of a intact uh, ecosystem. And that fundamental finding of the effect of sea otters as a keystone species on the ecosystem has been repeated over and over again uh, in the literature and, and studies at a variety of locations. So the 1970 translocation operation, uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, which at that time was called the Oregon State Game Commission, the Game Commission and Alaska Fish and Wildlife decided that uh, the Southern Oregon coast was the place to bring sea otters based on um, habitat that was there and the fact that sea otters had once been there. So the 1970 release was down near Port Orford. Back up on Chitka, that meant that sea otters had to be captured. So uh, some guys from the Oregon State Game Commission went to Alaska to work with a fish, uh, the Alaska Department biologists to actually capture the animals. They strung these um, uh, tangle nets with buoys across the surface and just enough weight to hang down in the water. And when the sea otters would swim into them, they could still get to the surface to breathe, but they were tangled and allowed capture. So pulling a 65, 70, 80 pound sea otter up to the boat, uh, who was not happy at all about having been captured, uh, made this uh, sometimes a dicey operation with fingers and, uh, um, I wouldn't say toes, but fingers and hands being subject to being bitten by these animals. So they hauled them into the boat, put them into these cages, and brought them to uh, a place where there were holding pens that had been constructed a few years before for the research of uh, Carl Kenyon, who, uh, if you are into sea otters at all, he wrote a book, uh, published a book in 1969 called The Sea Otter. And it's kind of like the operator's manual for sea otters. If you buy an, a, a sea otter and you want to know how to change the oil or um, you know, repair the, the, a flat tire on a sea otter, this is the book to buy. It's amazingly detailed. And Carl had been doing his research using these holding tanks 
on Amchitka. So the animals were placed in here until enough could be accumulated for uh, transport. Then they were each placed into these carrying cages with galvanized bottoms so that water and ice could be put in them to help keep them cool. And then down in Port Orford, uh, arrangements were, had to be made to receive them. And even though this uh, photo is taken in Alaska, it shows that uh, some guys building these floating net pens with styrofoam uh, flotation inside each of the, plant, the walkways around a, an enclosed pen of netting uh, that was netted across the bottom where the animals could be released to, to acclimate and get over the flight. Yeah, and um, one of the guys I talked to said that he thought that the uh, it was the Oregon Game Commission crews that bu actually built these on site near Port Orford. But that meant that they had to be lifted into place. So the Coast Guard was enlisted. This buoy tender from Astoria came down to Port Orford to lift these uh, pen components and their anchors and take them out into the harbor to be uh, deployed. So there were two net pens constructed and, and put in place. Uh, near Nellie's Cove, which is, I'll show you a map in a minute, the, a sheltered spot on the south side of the headland at Port Orford. And they could get there by small boat. So that's even, even that is a significant little project. So the animals would be uh, put into a, uh, taken from the trucks, put into the boats uh, there in Port Orford and delivered by boat around the corner to these two holding pens out near the, uh, the heads. So on, everything was ready on July 18th, 1970, these 31 animals were flown 2,600 miles from Amchitka to Port Orford. Uh, they arrived on the morning of uh, July 18th uh, on this air, uh, airfield, which itself was built near the end of World War II uh, for heavy bombers that would, might be needed to uh, in the war effort. So animals were unloaded uh, from the, the belly of the plane and put into these trucks to be trucked down to the port area. And if you look really closely, there, the truck is back down across the beach to where the animals in their cages could be lifted from the, from the truck and put into these boats for transport to the floating net pens. So here they are being transported around the corner and put into the, the pens. They were there for several days. The plan was to keep the marrow a week. And while they were there, of course, they had to be fed. Uh, apparently, they were fed fresh squid and fish fillets. Uh, they preferred the fish fillets. And in fact, Bruce had told me that they would actually stuff extra, uh, excuse me, extra uh, fish fillets into their little pouches before they went away. They just grabbed as much as they could because the, that was what they preferred. Fun fact to know and tell. So biologists monitored the animals out there. And by the end of the second day, the things looked pretty good, even though two animals had not really recovered from the, the flight and, and died. But it looked like hey, things were ready to go. So the plan was to take them, tow the net pens from Port Orford down towards Humbug Mountain. Um, and that was the plan. I'm not sure in retrospect it was the right plan, but yeah, that was the plan. So uh, the boats took off. A couple of commercial fishing boats towed them, one boat per net pen. And they got underway from Nellie's Cove, headed out towards Humbug Mountain. And I'm sure that Lee or anybody else who has boated down there knows that once you get out from behind the lee of that headland, where it's sheltered, and get out into open water by the afternoon, and when the wind kicks up at Port Orford, uh, it can make for a pretty gnarly situation. And so apparently the pens were rocking and rolling. The animals were having a tough time keeping up because they were confined really within the floating area of the, of the, the pen. And by the time uh, they got out of ways, the pens themselves started to come apart from uh, the tossing the and turning in, in the waves. So a decision was made to uh, stop the tow 
cut the pens open and release the animals there. So 29 animals were released into the water, some of which made it back to the dock at Port Orford before the boat did. So that was even uh, north of Humbug, which near Redfish Rocks, which is today the Marine Reserve area. So let's jump forward. We'll leave those behind and we'll jump forward to what happened in 1971. So in 71, the plan was to release two batches of animals. Uh, they would fly in on an airplane to the North Bend Airport, where some animals, 40 plus, would be taken out to Charleston and for, to Cape Arago, and the remaining animals would go on down to Port Orford. So the plan for Cape Arago was that they would be uh, taken from the airport by truck out to Charleston, loaded onto boats, taken around the Cape Arago headland to net pens that had been placed in South Cove at Cape Arago. Again, a sheltered environment for them to be released. And uh, again, things did not go as planned. So here's the otters landing at the North Bend Airport. Again, a lot of effort human power, manpower to take these things off the plane. You have a 80, 100 pound, 80 or 100 pound animal plus the weight of the pen. Uh, it took a couple guys to lift them off the plane and put them out where uh, they could be then loaded into the trucks. And again, as in Port Orford, this was quite a community event. There was a big crowd showed up at the airport to watch uh, the animals being unloaded. Uh, this man with the water, Carl Hall, uh, or excuse me, Bill Hall, I, I still lives um, near Coos Bay. I talked a couple times to him. He actually went to Alaska up to Amchitka to help uh, capture the animals and transport them back, although he said he had the good sense to bring a commercial flight back to Oregon, not be on the plane with him because the animals screamed the whole way back. So Carl at the North Bend Airport was dousing them with cold water because the animals can really overheat out of that cold marine environment uh, because they've got such a, a high thermal temperature inside and then the fur keeping all that in. So there was concern about uh, uh, overheating. So Carl and others would, uh, were dousing the animals. So again, uh, they're put into these trucks, transported out to boats at Charleston for the transit to South Cove. But by the time this happened, late in the afternoon, a storm had moved in from the south, a summer storm. And uh, Bruce said by the time the boats got to the end of the jetties going into the ocean, it was really, really dicey for those small boats. And the decision was made to release the animals directly into the water before they got as far as the net pens in Nellie's Cove. So those 40 plus animals, 41 animals were released directly into the ocean, uh, not far from the entrance to Coos Bay. The remaining animals were foiled, were flown, and foiled, uh, flown down to, to uh, Cape Blanco Airfield, uh, again, delivered by truck down to the port area. But that same storm that had blown in uh, was also hammering Port Orford and uh, they couldn't even get the net pens by boat out, or excuse me, the animals in, out to the net pens. A couple of the cages were washed overboard, some animals drowned. So again, the decision was made to release them right then and there. So instead of getting out to the net pens, the animals were put directly into the water. So the question is what happened? You know, what happened uh, in, in really in both years? But one of the things that really struck me in, in reviewing all of this is that it's one thing to see a list on paper of places where sea otters were seen. And that's another thing to think about those in real as real places. So one thing I wanted to do here with this and for myself was to really explore where these places are and what they look like. So these are some of the major sites named in the survey data over the, the, the next 10 years of places where sea otters were seen. And you can see that there's a fairly broad distribution from Coos Bay itself all the way down to Cape Sebastian and Myers Creek south of the Rogue River. Most of them will be around uh, the Cape Blanco 
area or Simpson Reef. And we'll look at those in detail. So here's the Cape Arago Simpson Reef area, at least part of it. And you can see uh, the upper bay and the, the South Slough there, as well as the, all the little places are around the headland that uh, provide sea otter habitat. At the south end of the Cape Arago headland, of course, is Cape Arago itself, with South Cove where the net pens had been set up. Uh, Simpson Reef just offshore, Shell Island, and we'll see more of this in a moment. But this is really the primary area where sea otters were seen, including here at Cape Arago Simpson Reef. And I know that a number of you have been down there. You go to that uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service State Parks lookout at Simpson Reef Overlook, and this is the view you get. Uh, Shell Island out there, in this case, covered with seals, sea lions, and elephant seals. But it also was primary habitat and wonderful habitat for sea otters. Gull Rock down by Cape Blanco was kind of a surprise to me. I'd never really thought about this place, but it shows up in the stories of indigenous people as being an area that was favored for hunting uh, sea otters. It's a large cluster of rocks just offshore of the mouth of the Sixes River, north of Cape Blanco. And it provides a lot of these little habitat-y, hidey places for sea otters to get out of the weather. It's bigger than it looks. If you go down there and look out there, it's like, eh, hey, there's a rock out there. If you map it out on Google Earth, it's actually a significant feature. So then Cape Blanco itself is named uh, without you know, distinction as to exactly where, but here's Cape Blanco sticking out into the ocean with, it shows the relationship to Blanco Reef and Orford Reef, and then way in the distance is uh, Cape Sebastian, and in the middle distance off to the left is Humbug Mountain. Blanco Reef is just off the tip of Cape Blanco, a relatively shallow or more shallow than Orford Reef. Uh, not many rocks for them to climb out on, although they don't always need that. But Blanco Reef shows up a lot in the data. Just south of there is Orford Reef, a little bit deeper, with a lot more pinnacle rocks coming up out of it. This area is, uh, animals were seen out here several times, but not nearly as often at Cape Blanco. Port Orford Heads itself, uh, and I put this in here not because animals were seen here, but because you can see where Nellie's Cove is in relation to Orford Reef, and then way to the north there, up another 10 miles north at Cape Blanco. Humbug Mountain is named several times, although without distinction as to exactly where. This is on the kelp forest, kelp beds on the south side of Humbug Mountain. That's a little inaccessible. Uh, to get to, so I'm not sure that it was observed easily or readily, uh, but yet that's a prime habitat. And then all the way down to Cape Sebastian Myers Creek, there's a cluster of rocks down there along the beach. And again, it was not clear from the data exactly where on the headland or around which rock, but uh, this gives you an idea of where it is. So initial observations. So in uh, the animals were, were released in, in uh, June of 1970. And about two months later, Bruce started doing these uh, surveys. Uh, and as by his own admission, he undoubtedly missed a lot of them just because it's a big area to survey. And um, you know, you're on shore with binoculars or a, a spotting scope, and it's it's not the easiest. But here's what he saw on uh, August 26th, he observed eight animals, including one up in the Coos Bay estuary, up near the, the bridge. He said it was an older female that they had kind of had become distinguished to them in the net pens at Port Orford because she didn't really want to eat. But that was her, apparently, up near the bridge in North Bend, where she stayed for quite a while, uh, eating crab and clams and basically enjoying herself. Uh, he saw a couple at Cape Arago, two at Cape Blanco and three south of Humbug Mountain. So that was within two months they had spread that far, some of them at least. <clears throat> then in October, he saw a total of 14 animals, including the one female still up in Coos Bay, but most of them were clustered down around Cape Blanco, Orford Reef, Gull Rock, and Humbug Mountain. 
later on in talking to some of the sea otter people about this release of the 29 animals that were released at Port Orford, if you, 14 of them apparently at least survived. And that's a 48% retention rate, which is considered to be pretty good. So by the spring then of 71, before the next batch arrived, and Bruce counted one up at Bassendorf Beach, just near the mouth of Coos Bay, and then three out at Orford Reef. Not that the numbers matter, but it does show that the animals did in fact survive that first winter. So then in June uh, was uh, when the uh, animals were, uh, June 24th, the animals were released there at uh, the mouth of Coos Bay. The next day, he went out and counted 11 animals at Simpson Reef, and we're assuming that those were from the previous day. The next day, one of those animals died, was found on the beach. We don't know about any of the animals, what happened to them released near Port Orford, because as I'll talk about later, they weren't tagged. And, and frankly, nobody was looking down there. So we don't, just because it shows up with no animals near Port Orford doesn't mean they weren't there. Uh, Bruce was, was observing uh, in uh, late June that the animals at, at Simpson Reef had divided into two groups, one at Gregory Point and one at, at the Simpson Reef itself. And then in ju late June, one animal was seen down at Myers Creek near Cape Sebastian, which is a long ways away. Now, we don't know if that animal was released at Port Orford or at Coos Bay, but the supposition is that it was released at Port Orford. So um, Bruce did a, an aerial survey between Crescent City, California and Florence in July, late July of, of 71, and observed eight animals three at uh, Cape Blanco, the others up around Cape Arago. But uh, interestingly enough, two of them at Five Mile Point or Whiskey Run, just south of Cape Arago. In the late 1971, uh, seven animals were counted uh, at Simpson Reef and two down at uh, Cape Sebastian. So Cape Sebastian continues to show up, but Simpson Reef also, in, ends up being a, a place of interest. By December of that year, we're seeing this distribution, Simpson Reef, Gull Rock, Orford Reef. In the spring of 72 is when Ron Jamison started doing his work on his masters. And he really began to um, survey quite regularly uh, the animals, both at uh, Simpson Reef and further south. So this is Ron and his wife with their camera uh, spotting scopes out at the Simpson Reef Overlook in, on February 25th, 1972. And it was on that day that Ron first spotted the, the uh, pup, the first pup known to be born from this batch of animals there at Simpson Reef. And he tracked that pup for uh, many, many, many months. So you can see there's quite a cluster of them now in February at Simpson Reef. But by August, the Simpson Reef population had dropped and he, he counted 10 animals down at Blanco Reef. By August of uh, 72, late summer, uh, nearly all the animals were showing up at Blanco Reef and not at Simpson Reef. And Ron speculated that uh, it was his view that a lot of human presence foot traffic, as it were, in the North Cove around Simpson Reef, a lot of it driven by the desire to go see the sea otters, had uh, spooked them and the, they vacated the area. So this is a pattern that kind of shows up for the next few years of uh, animals being at Simpson Reef during the winter, but by late spring, they leave and end up down at Blanco Reef, which is interesting. In September of 72, there's a huge cluster down at, at uh, Blanco Reef and only a couple of them at Cape Arago. Likewise, into December, most of them are down. This, these guys are out on Orford Reef, not Blanco Reef, which is interesting to me. By spring of, of 73, they clearly spent the winter on Simpson Reef 
and that's where most of them are seen, but there's still a good, a good bunch down at uh, Blanco Reef. By late April, uh, they're starting to move again, show up more uh, down at Blanco Reef and fewer at Simpson Reef. And by summer, they're all down at, uh, or all, all that were observed at Blanco Reef. And I want to caution that just because animals weren't seen someplace doesn't mean that they're not there. They're not easy to see. They're not easy to see from the air. They're not easy, easy to spot from land, even if you've got spotting scopes and telescopes. So just because they're not there doesn't mean that they aren't there. I mean, just because we can't see them. Bruce also and uh, Ron did a, an aerial survey during this time. And this was uh, the aerial survey results. So in summer of 73, this in some respects, this is the high point of the population. You had uh, a couple of animals at uh, Simpson Reef, including a pup, and then many of them down at Orford Reef, Gull Rock, and Blanco Reef further south, and again, a pup down there, a little orange dot. So after Ron completed his master's work, uh, he and Oregon Game Commission guys did really an annual survey. So this became kind of the foundation for annual surveys taken every summer. And what, what was lost then is this seasonal move that was detected in the first few years uh, with Bruce's observations and Ron's observations. So, but it does give, an, uh, the summer surveys do give an indication of the level of the population. So summer of 73, Summer of 74, and this time there's five pups at um, Blanco Reef, which is a good thing. But we're down to a total of 21 animals. By 75, there's a pup still at the Blanco Reef, but we're down to a total of 13 animals. 12 animals the next summer in 76. 77, there's four animals. 78, a total of four animals, including a pup. 79, 80, there were no surveys. 1981, one animal was seen at Cape Blanco, at Blanco Reef. And after that, there were no more surveys because apparently there were no more animals. So the question is, what happened? What happened to the otters both spatially and, and um, as a population? And one of the, the things that made it really difficult to know is that the animals were not tagged. Tagging a sea otter is not easy. They don't, they don't, uh, they're not conducive to having a tag stuck on their, excuse me, stuck on their fur uh, because they need to keep their fur groomed constantly uh, to protect them against the cold of the ocean. And as they really don't like having a tag put on their flippers and their, or their ears. It's just, it's very difficult. So, Animals were not tagged, and as it turns out, animals were not tagged at any of the other release locations, whether in Washington or British Columbia or Southeast Alaska. And in fact, there were probably more observations in Oregon than any of those other sites too, as it turns out. But tagging, the lack of tagging really makes it difficult to know exactly what happened, whether you're seeing the same animal repeatedly at the same place, or whether animals are moving around. Uh, it's not hard to know the sex ratio of them because they're not tagged. So that's, that's a technology that's being improved. Monterey Bay Aquarium and others are working with U.S. Fish to improve that te technology. But that's something we'll, we'll really need to have in hand as we go at this the, the next time. The main phenomenon that happened, though, it seems to be uh, the emigration, the term used for animals basically just leaving and never being seen again. That is not an uncommon phenomenon. In fact, it's almost universal in translocation releases like this, where a number of animals just split. They're gone. Uh, and then what happens to them, nobody really knows. In this case, some animals were seen north of the release sites. Later on, up near Neskowin, animals were seen. And then a group of four otters were seen up in Washington in early 1972 that may, in fact, have joined the, the uh, group that was uh, translocated to the Olympic coast. So it could be that some of the animals from here in an, in an attempt to swim north uh, to head home uh, joined up with that group in on the Olympic coast 
and perhaps made that a successful population. Who knows? Uh, it's just speculation. So um, the 93 animals that were released over two years, uh, this was actually a very large total compared to some of the other release sites, 59 in Washington and 55 in, in, on Vancouver Island. The initial uh, retention rate of 48% from the 1970 release at Port Orford is pretty good. And uh, the uh, retention rate of 11 of 41 at Simpson Reef in 71 was decent, 27%. We, and, but we really have no idea what happened in Port Orford. But in general, 25 of 93 animals were counted and uh, released, uh, excuse me, a survival rate of 27%. We do not know the male to female ratio of the remaining 25 animals, of those animals. Uh, the sex ratio was known going into the uh, translocation. It was on the order of 60% female, uh, 40 for, percent male, but we have no idea what the remaining um, animal sex ratio was, and that could be critical in reproduction over time. On the bright side, the animals seem to have adapted to the region. They found and occupied the key habitats, the habitats you'd think they would. And if you just sort of step back for a moment and you think about a sea otter, it's basically the size of a German shepherd dog. And it's down there in the water. It doesn't know the area. It doesn't have a map. And yet these animals found the habitats that seem to be suited to sea otters. It's just, to me, it's absolutely astounding that they would do that. And to do that repeatedly and move, for instance, between Simpson Reef and Blanco Reef. So they begin to know the region. Uh, surprisingly, they did not occupy some areas that we would think they would occupy, such as the Port Orford area itself, the heads, and around uh, just to the south at Redfish Rocks, which is uh, seems pretty obvious to us. Hey, there's a lot of kelp there. Why not? Or Rogue Reef off the mouth of the Rogue River, which is where you would think that they would occupy. They went further south down to Cape Sebastian, but not other areas even further south at Crook Point and Mac Reef uh, seem to have uh, would have good sea otter habitat. Other than one animal, in the, that female in the Coos estuary, uh, they seem to not to have occupied estuaries. At least they were not reported as, as having been in estuaries. We know that pups were born, a total of them, uh, of 11 were born, which is good news. And uh, although um, some of the sea otter ecologists tell me that that's actually a smaller number that might be expected from that size population, but again, that could reflect the uh, a lower male to female ratio of the surviving animals. And we know the pups were, were born both at Simpson Reef and 45 miles to the south at Blanco Reef. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's popped up over the last few years is, uh, did genetics make a difference? Were they the fact that these animals were quote unquote, a northern subspecies make a difference? Should they have been the southern subspecies from California? Uh, that concern seems to have originated a little bit from a study in 08 of the genetic signature uh, of animals along the Oregon coast, which uh, at that time using that technology seemed to indicate that the animals, the ancient animals in Oregon were more of the southern sea otter type. But subsequent studies have really indicated that uh, ancient otters in Oregon belong to northern sea otter subspecies. And in any event, the Oregon coast was likely a transition zone between those further north and those from the south. And there's really no evidence that genetics played a part in, in this uh, situation. Question about habitat and prey. Yes, it appears to be uh, sufficient. Uh, the modeling done with uh, Tinker et al. in our a feasibility study uh, shows that uh, the reef complexes around Blanco, Orford, Simpson Reef, and other sites are in the particularly south of Coos Bay, um, have an abundance of preferred habitat and prey populations that would be needed to sustain sea otters. And, so, and the fact that they stuck around and seemed to have moved back and forth 
seem to corroborate that. Again, it's surprising that the areas of redfish rock, rogue, rogue reef and mac reef, the fact that they were not occupied means that those areas might in fact be potential untapped habitat. Just because the animal didn't go there doesn't mean it's not suitable uh, for them. 11 pops was good news. And uh, uh, the analysis of uh, Dominique uh, Kone in his uh, master's thesis, his estimate is that based on modeling that Oregon coast could uh, optimally support 4,000 sea otters. Uh, none of us in this room will see that. Um, well, even if we bring them back, that's, um, that's a huge number. But the fact is habitat and prey are sufficient for sea otters in the Oregon coast. Question about enough animals, should we release more? Uh, it seems to have been sufficient, especially when you compare it to some of the other areas where translocations occurred. Uh, something though seemed to have happened after 1975. And Tim Tinker and others just basically say, you know, you get a small population size, uh, stochasticity sets in where any little random event can cause a decline in the population and um, take the population to zero eventually. In fact, Tim's modeling shows uh, taking those 93 animals. This is a computer model that uh, Dr. Tinker developed uh, and Dominique used in his uh, master's thesis. But uh, if you put a certain number of animals in at the, uh, at the beginning, there's always a drop off during the emigration phase. The uh, curve of possibilities ranges from going to zero at about uh, 12 years out or uh, as high as uh, you know, well up into the hundreds. And Tim uh, took the, uh, re the population counts that were observed and 73, 4, 5, and uh, plotted them here on this uh, modeling chart and shows that, yeah, indeed, um, the possibility of zero exists with this number of animals. And that seems to be what happened. So we can conclude, I think, that habitat and prey appear to have been sufficient, that the animal handling and transportation were probably not factors in this. Uh, they were the same as the other translocations that occurred. Uh, the stressful release events, even though I, I'm sure everybody wished they would have occurred differently, may have exacerbated some emigration, but that was likely not determinative in the overall success of the population. Sufficient number of animals seemed to have been released. Emigration was clearly a factor, but probably not the sole factor. The subspecies question, northern versus sub, uh, southern, was likely not a factor. We don't know about mortalities. 11 mortalities were observed and counted during this period, but you know there may have been more. We simply don't know because they weren't reported. Uh, there's uh, speculation, and Bruce May just feels like there may have been more at the hands of humans than were reported, but that's you know, we can't we we can't dismiss that, but we don't know. Uh, animals were found and aggregated repeatedly at sites that were predicted by our modeling, and uh, but th this is what I take home is that some things can never be fully known, and Mother Nature always bats last. So for lessons for next time, we've got to account for emigration. Uh, Pretty confident that the southern coast has appropriate sea otter habitat, not that there isn't appropriate habitat elsewhere. Uh, tagging and close monitoring, though, is critical. Successive follow-up translocations, even of a few animals over the years uh, following a big release, uh, may enable success. The modeling seems to show that. And in any event, weather must be accounted for. So the postscript is that the Cape Blanco airfield is still there and it's waiting for the next time. So here's, if you're interested, here's references, uh, people I talked to, things I read, and a lot of uh, advice and assistance from a variety of people. So uh, visit our website. I'm gonna, we're, I'm gonna be giving this as a webinar in a week, and that will be posted on our YouTube channel, but. Uh, this is the world's best website devoted to sea otters. So anything you want to know, uh, you could probably find it starting here.
I'm not proud of it or anything. <laughs> so questions, let's get into it. Thank you. Greg. Oh, uh, excuse me. We, we have a microphone so that uh, people on the uh, on the Zoom can uh, hear the question. All right, go ahead with Greg over here. Yeah. I know you got to be quick to uh, get a, a question here because there's so many people and that. So that's why I raised my hand so quick. Um, but great presentation, Bob. Thank you for the uh, great talk and all the research that you did and all you've done to you know inform this. One of the things that I saw sort of missing on the lessons learned sort of side of things was you mentioned Bruce's concerns about um, you know uh, human interactions and people possibly uh, killing them. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, there is a, a potential conflict with fisheries and, you know, the fact that they eat a fair bit. So it would seem that, that you know, I know you guys are starting and I know that U.S. Fish and Wildlife has started, but it would seem that that would be a key point on the lessons learned is working with the communities and the, you know, people involved and, you know, those that there might be conflicts with. Um, can you, would you like to speak to that at all? Sure. Uh, yeah. The question is really, uh, how are we working in the communities to make sure that uh, sea otters don't become literally a target? And uh, that's, that's something that we're very concerned about. So we are reaching out to uh, fishermen, particularly on the South Coast. We've got a big project coming up down there to work one-on-one -on -one with a number of them on where they crab, where they urchin dive, and uh, kind of what their thoughts are about um, or, um, sea otters returning. Um, building public support is crucial. We want to make this so well received in communities with eyes and ears on these animals that Someone taking a shot at them or even talking about that is going to stand out from the crowd. We want people to really welcome these animals and make it a community thing so that people don't feel like they can just get away with doing that, doing harm to them and not being noticed. So that's part of the strategy. Who knows if it'll be successful? But it's our hope that we can work with the communities to understand the, the significance, uh, not only to the ecosystem, but to the community of having these animals around, that they would be a community treasure. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I personally, I believe based on the data that the actual impacts to uh, crabbers and uh, in particular is going to be way less than feared. Urchin guys, yeah, you bet. that, that Those are fisheries that are probably going to get clobbered. Fin fishers, we're picking up a lot of support in the fin fish community, particularly the recreational crowd, who understands that rebuilding some of these kelp reef ecosystems is essential to long-term sustainable fisheries. So I guess um, my answer, Greg, is that, yeah, we're well aware of the community dynamics at play and the stakeholder dynamics that potentially at play, uh, but we wanna make this a positive thing for the communities where these animals come back and um, put some peer pressure on people to behave themselves. Uh, question way up there. Hi. Oh, there you go. Great. I have a question. At the beginning, uh, according to indigenous stories, the sea otters naturally occurred around Otter Rock, I believe you said. Why wouldn't that be a location suitable for reintroduction now? Yeah, the question was, why wouldn't uh, Sea Otter Rock or Otter Rock or Otter Point be a, an area? And, and it is part of a cluster of, of sites that are probably suitable um, and certainly is on our radar as being an area um, likely to support them if we release them there. Part of the, part of the thing that another take home and that I didn't write down is that these animals will go wherever they want. So uh, we had thought that, you know, based on looking at habitat and so on that 
you know, redfish rocks and even rogue reef would be a great place to release them. And they were not observed there. So it doesn't mean they weren't there. But back to your question, you know, we could put them at Gull Rock and, and certainly uh, that site would probably support a few animals, but not nearly the entire population. So we'll be looking at a number of sites and a region that has a cluster of sites. You know, quite honestly, from seal rocks here up to Cape Fallon weather and Depot Bay, that's not a bad stretch of, of uh, habitat either. And there's a number of potential habitat sites there as well. So it's not just one site, it's gonna be kind of a cluster within a region. One of the surprises to me, uh, and I haven't really explored this too much, uh, except I did ground truth it with one of the ecologists is, did they really in fact move from Simpson Reef 45 miles down to Blanco Reef seasonally? That's a lot. And so, which to me says, these things can get their arms around um, a region and understand it and know where they are in it in relation to the seasons and habitat and so on. So Gull Rock is, and um, Otter Point are clearly gonna be part of the equation. And they may find and occupy those over time. Uh, so we'll do our best to account for those areas. Thank you. I have a question online real quick. Um, so we've got Bruce Mate on the line and he's asking if you can talk a little bit about the Washington translocation. Oh, the question is what's going on in Washington? That's right. The Washington population is, a, and thanks Bruce for, for being on the line, that's uh, I learned a lot from you. The Washington population is now up to nearly 3,000 animals. Uh, it has been at that level for a couple of years now. Michelle uh, Z, you might have more information on that, but I think that's about it. They tend to be primarily along the uh, from the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, south to just north of Grays Harbor but they don't tend to come south. Yeah, so doing, doing pretty well. My question was, was there any concern about the other large animals, the marine mammals in the area, such as the elephant seals or the sea lions when reintroducing them or during this attempt? Interactions between uh, sea otters and other marine mammals, that's the question. I don't think that's a problem. I've not picked up that that's a problem from any of the, the uh, sea otter ecology people. I will uh, just relate a little anecdote. Uh, one of the uh, people that worked on our feasibility study, Jan Hodder, she and her husband, Mike, lived down uh, near Coos Bay and are avid marine life people. I mean, she taught at OIMB for years. She told a story of one time when there was a, a, a uh, one of these random sea otters that had shown up around the Cape Arago area. They went out to, to watch it near Simpson Reef. And she said, looking through the binoculars, the animal, the sea otter came up out of the water into a crowd of sea lions and elephant seals who just left. It sort of like cleared a path for this little guy coming up out of the water. So there may be a, some sort of understood language between these animals that, uh, helps them exist together. So uh, we don't, I don't think that's gonna be a problem. They eat different things. They don't prey on the same things. They occupy different habitats, different parts of the water column. So I, I, we don't see it's gonna be a problem. But I could stand corrected. Yes, sir. Yeah, not to put too fine a point on the uh, fisherman interaction, but I was in uh, Morro Bay in the late seventies and I found a dead on, otter on the beach that was down toward the southern end of their range at that time, and mm -hmm. it had a 22 slug uh, in its skull. Um, one uh, bad intended fisherman with a rifle can make all the difference. And I remember being in Coos Bay during the late 70s and seeing a boat out at Simpsons Reef, and you could hear gunshots out there. So, yeah. uh, you know, even if you do have good relationships with the local community, one individual can make a hell of a big difference in this. Yeah, I don't disagree at all. Uh, the The effect of, of a person with a weapon is uh, can be disastrous. 
Other questions? Oh, we have one. This is a lot of work getting this microphone around in this auditorium. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, I'm just curious, as you know, the retention rate for otters has long been um, one of the major obstacles to being successful in these translocation attempts. And it's often been thought that if you could keep them in these holding pens for some length of time, that that might increase those retention rates. But nobody seems to have been able to do that successfully so far. I'm just curious, with the 1970 release, you mentioned that it was intended that they were going to keep them in the holding pen for one week, but they released them after only two days. Do you know why that was? They just appeared to be doing well. They were eating well. They seemed to be in and out of the water. Um, both uh, uh, Bill Hall and, and, uh, and Bruce mentioned to me that you know the judgment was made with those who in charge that they seem to be doing fine. Let's just re let's release them. Hmm. I think in retrospect, and talking to Ron Jameson about it, he was not there on scene at the time, but of course spent a lot of time with those who were immediately afterwards. And I think all concerned um, agreed that towing the, the net pen to another location was probably not the best idea. That having them in the net pen and then a soft release would have been preferable. Yes. So when the time comes for a new relocation, do you just hop on Amazon and look for a deal for 100 sea otters, or yep. where, where will these new animals come from? We, we do. We're, we're going to, and then we'll get FedEx to bring them down. Um, just to, to, to talk about the Alaka Alliance and kind of where we are in the process right now, we are beginning to work with a number of partners, U.S. Fish, Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, a lot of folks on what exactly are all the steps that will be needed for an actual translocation. Everything from animal care and handling veterinary care to transportation, to the source animals, to the release sites, to all the regulatory requirements, et cetera. So I would say in the next two years, year and a half, we're going to have a, a little working group really zero in on this source issue. Where will these animals come from? At first blush, you think, wow, there's 30,000 animals in Southeast Alaska, and there's a bunch of communities up there who would probably love to give away a thousand or more from their front yard. So that seems like an obvious place to get them. On the other hand, um, there may be some reasons to think about animals from California, too, uh, who are having trouble with range expansion. Uh, they've been kind of fenced in uh, at the northern part of their range at Pigeon Point now for a number of years. And there may be reasons to think about uh, the southern sea otter as part of that initial population. So uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, there's, we know there's animals well to the north. Uh, and there's animals to the south. To me, Alaska makes real sense in that it's there's a lot of them. Uh, they're in an area that where they could be uh, captured relatively easily. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I'm not the guy out there doing it, so we'll figure that out with people who have had experience. There's a whole team of folks in uh, the U.S. Uh, interestingly enough, the U.S. Geological Survey, Alaska was it the Alaska Ecology Center? The, there's a whole team of people up there who do nothing but or have a great experience with sea otter capturing and handling. So uh, we'll we'll be involving the smart people in that decision. Lee. Yeah, thanks. So I really liked how you walked through the timeline of Bruce and Ron Jameson's sightings over time. And I, you kind of alluded to my question when you were talking about the absence of sea otters, not necessarily, or the absence of any sightings, not mm -hmm. really indicating that they weren't there. Um, and as a spatial ecologist, I'm always interested in where the effort is. So when you were talking to Ron and Bruce, did they walk you through how they actually did their surveys of the coastal region? Because some of those areas have lookouts and you can easily view yeah from shore, but like getting like the difference between um, 
observing sea otters at Cape Blanco versus Orford Reef? I mean, it's very different. You can only really get out to Orford Reef with a boat. So did they do boat surveys? There were some boat surveys, yes. There were, there were not many, but there were a few surveys taken by boat, but most of them were from land with the telescopes. And did they like, did they have even survey or go to the same places all the time? Like, did, did they I walk you through know. that? I honestly don't know the yeah. details of the actual observation sites and methodology. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Just curious if that could help inform, you know, where they didn't see animals. Versus, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the things we need to pay attention to thinking this thing through for future translocations is what is the monitoring protocol? Who's going to do it where and kind of how are we going to do this? So we're collecting the best possible data. Yeah, because I, I, I must say I had a lot of questions going through this about, you know, I, I felt like I was looking, you know, you, you look at a window screen and you get it up close and pretty soon you can see right through the mesh and there's nothing there. So I felt like I was looking through the data sometimes uh, for information that just wasn't there. I'm yeah, grateful thanks. for what is, but it's frustrating. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap up there. But before we say goodbye to Bob, I do want to announce that on Thursday, we're going to have another sea otter talk here, the science seminar by Keith Miles from the U.S. Geological Survey. We'll also be talking about sea otters. So come back for that Thursday at 3.30 right here. And let's give Bob a big thank you. Thank you. All right, for folks online, we're going to end the presentation. Thanks so much. If you have questions, follow up with Bob directly. Yeah. 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 I was.